Today I would like to introduce our very own Rana Johnson, who is going to be uh, sharing with us um, our palliative care topic of the day. And um, she's going to be presenting on shortness of breath and dyspnea. So if you have any questions about today's didactic, make sure you write those down because we're actually going to have an opportunity at the end of the didactic to, um, to be able to bring those up and, uh, and share your comments or ask your questions for Rana. So I'm going to turn things over to Rana to start. And uh, again, thanks for being here. Well, hello, Echo Land. Thanks for coming out and hanging out with us. So today, like Chris said, we're going to talk a little bit about shortness of breath, which can be an incredibly distressing symptom uh, for patients and even families and caregivers. So, um, so what we hope to get out of today is really talking about four factors that can contribute to the symptoms of dyspnea, um, naming two medications to effectively treat it, and three non-pharmacological ways to manage symptoms. Those are really important as well and sometimes overlooked. So to get everybody on the same page, it's, it's important to, to, um, to define dyspnea. Um, CAPC, which is the Centers to Advanced Palliative Care, defines it as, the, it refers to the sensation or uncomfortable breathing. And then the um, American Thoracic Surgeons, um, they describe it as a subjective experience of breathing, just kind of qualitatively distinct sensations that can vary in intensity. Um, probably the, the important things to get out of these, the takeaway of it is it's not just a physical symptom, it's definitely lots of things going on. And dyspnea can occur normally, um, but it can usually, if it, it can uh, be a symptom of uh, disease. Um, if it is occurring and it's not taller, it, breathing is getting poor during activities that are, are typically well tolerated. So next slide. So we talked about this a little bit, um, the feelings of that, of the dyspnea. So anxiety, fear, panic, and even a sensation of impending death. So it's important not to, not to um, gloss over the emotional stress um, that can often come with a symptom. So um, when we're thinking about this, and we're thinking about how patients can often describe this, they're talking, they, they use words like air hunger or trouble breathing, increased effort. Sometimes people will talk about their chest feeling tight. You'll see often rapid breathing, um, short breaths, or a feeling of just being overall suffocated. All of these things, when you think about that wadded up, if somebody presents to a clinic or to a hospital or um, and they're talking about dyspnea, it's a really, it's a really hard one to tease out among all of these things, you know, the, the physiological, the psychological, social, or environmental, those can absolutely all be um, related to the symptom. And so it's really important to do um, kind of your homework about the symptom. So when we think about this as well, and the, the quality of life, um, I know most of us have seen people that experience the symptom and the physical distress is one thing. Um, it, there's often an increase in ED visits. That panic can drive people directly to emergency care. Um, it's really um, definitely correlated with depression. People with uh, dyspnea oftentimes have a significant depression, um, anxiety component, fatigue, of course, and the deconditioning that comes along with it. Um, when looking at this, this particular symptom, it's, it's said that it was, it's the most important variable influencing the will to live among terminally ill patients and second most common reason to initiate palliative sedation. If you think about the prevalence of it and how often it happens, 50% um, of outpatient cancer patients, that's a lot, 70% um, in terminal phases. And the presence in cancer patients, in, like a new onset presence, indicates a 30-day mortality rate. 90% um, of patients dying with lung cancer experience dyspnea. 95% of those with DOP um, will report it as the most distressing and debilitating symptom. Um, one of only three symptoms present in 50% of all patients with cancer, AIDS, heart disease, COPD, and renal disease. So you can see dyspnea as being one of those, those symptoms that's really significant and woven through a really large um, pool of people and disease burdens. 
So 62% of patients with dyspnea have been having symptoms greater than three months. So when we're thinking about um, activities, oftentimes um, we'll, we'll ask patients if they're short of breath. And a lot of times they'll say no um, because they're, they're, the literature will say 97% of lung cancer patients actually decrease their activity so they're no longer short of breath. And 80% will socially isolate them so they don't themselves so they don't have to move around in public or or um, tax their body or get stressed out about it. So um, this symptom in particular, climbing stairs, 95% of almost 96% of patients will re re report dyspnea with climbing stairs. 47, almost 50% with just walking slowly. Over 50% with getting dressed. This was significant um, eye-opener for me that almost 60% just talking and eating and 26% of patients at rest. So it's a significant um, burden um, on the mind, body, and spirit. So it, when we're thinking about why it occurs, it can be really um, multifactorial. Um, it can be the ventilator demand, um, the decreased ability to move air, um, airway resistance, increased airway resistance, like the um, squeezing down of the tubes, and decreased pulmonary compliance if somebody has um, scarring in their lungs. Or it can be a combination of any of the above. So when we think about kind of underlying causes of dyspnea, it's important to, to kind of open, open ourselves beyond just um, COPD um, and heart failure and start to look at some other causes, so medication side effects like chemotherapy and steroids, um, metabolic infections such as uh, electrolyte disturbances, sepsis, um, anemia, neuromuscular, like one of the big ones is um, ALS, or uh, any kind of um, myopathies or even deconditioning, upper airways such as foreign bo body, something that's um, kind of squeezing off that tube. Um, and even secretions. So uh, for the lung and the, and the lower airway, typically we'll see pneumonia or um, PE, um, COPD, that's kind of all where that lives. The cardiac is the heart attack, of course, um, heart failure, valve disease, arrhythmias, all of those things can really play into how people are breathing or feel the sensation of the ability to get air. And also for the GI symptoms, um, often that ascites, that big gut, can really decrease the ability for lungs to take in air. So when we're thinking about it and talking about it, remember that it's really subjective. Um, so it's a, it's a feeling that has, as we talked about, so many, so many parts and pieces to it. So there are certain things that we can measure, such as we can do labs and we can do x-rays and we can do pulmonary function tests. And they're kind of helpful when we're trying to figure out why somebody's feeling short of breath, but they don't describe necessarily the degree of severity. It's important to know that also tachypnea you know, or, or quick breathing is not, we don't cl classify that as dyspnea. Um, it's important, especially probably key, is to address the emotions before proceeding to the medical evaluation. You're not going to get very far um, with a physical assessment or a history um, if you're not really responding to the stress that somebody has when they're not able to breathe. So when, when we're kind of thinking about how do we get information out of somebody who says that they're not short of breath, but clearly their lips are blue, you might want to ask, do you get short of breath walking the same speed as somebody else your age? Or do you have to stop and catch your breath when walking upstairs? You know, how many stairs? How often is this happening? Is this new? Do you get short of breath when you're eating? Again, those things are often um, really telltale signs of somebody having a really significant time outside of what you're seeing in your clinical space. So um, adaptation and the physical characteristics and psychological conditions, they can affect the quality and intensity of perception of breathlessness. So if somebody is, um, that has that anxiety component on top of a lung cancer or a tumor, um, their feeling of breathlessness can be even that much more compounded. Um, so when, again, when we're talking to our patients and we're trying to tease out how significant this is, we want to really hit on that intensity. How severe is this for you? What, how is this impacting you? How limiting is it? for you? What are you doing that you normally would have done, you know, three months ago? Is there something different? Um, 
and how bothersome is it? How how much does it stress you out? Um, again, talking about trying to suss out why people are having these symptoms. Sudden um, sudden onset is really indicative indicative of something that's pretty significant. What makes it worse or better? Is it, um, you know, dial of bronchodilators? Is it positioning? Is it, um, you know, are they having trouble leaning, leaning back flat on their pillows? Um, how often is it happening and how long does it last? So there are assessment tools out there. It's important to know that there's no gold standard or a single instrument, but these are some validated um, assessment tools for uh, um, kind of evaluate, evaluating the significant, significance of dyspnea. Those who have CAPC, um, have access to CAPC, they actually have a lot of these tools um, in the uh, dyspnea um, uh, CE um, chapter. So um, kind of interesting to look through that because oftentimes, again, we we hear patients when they when they say they're short of breath, but we don't often dig a little bit deeper into it. So how much do we assess? This is really important when we're talking about patients who are poten potentially terminal. Um, so we need to be thinking about um, the trajectory of the illness or whether or not they're at the end of their life. What are their goals of care? Because sometimes when you open Pandora's box, it's really Really hard to shut it um, and so if it's something that is distressing to a patient but the, what's even more distressing is being in that hospital maybe that treatment or that assessment looks or workup looks a lot different than somebody who maybe is a lot younger age and has a different condition and um, is more apt to be um, amiable to kind of full court press so it's really, really important to be thinking about where a patient is in their disease trajectory and really what are their goals of care. So simple assessment is some of the things we don't often think about. Oxygen flowing is the tube kink. That's pretty important. Um, are they, are they, do they have swelling? Are they looking edematous? Are they overloaded? Um, maybe they have a new infection. Um, are they having anxiety or bowel or bladder distension? I know pretty much I had anxiety, bowel, and bladder distension on Friday. So again, um, dyspnea is a really subjective thing. Um, and we can also look into the extensive, um, is the pulmonary testing, the angiogram, or the imaging that, again, can get really time consuming. Sometimes it can be painful um, and risky. So um, those are all things to be considering. So to effectively treat um, dyspnea, it's important to really identify why somebody is having it. Is it that, um, is it a pathophysiological issue in their body? Is it reversible? Is it emotional? Um, and all of those things really take cause, um, should take cause so that we can effectively not only address it, but treat it and, and have a good outcome. So when we're thinking about pharmacological things, we tend to, if somebody walks in the door of a um, hospital or clinic setting, Typically, we, we throw medicine at them. It's kind of an easy way to get stuff happening pretty quickly. Um, diuretics, if, they're, if they seem volume overloaded, bronchodilators or steroids, um, antidepressants, thinking about all of those chronic uh, functional things um, that happen when somebody reports um, dyspnea. There was also a, um, a study that I was reading that was talking about bronchodilators and cancer patients and as many cancer patients that complain of that symptom there was only like I think 25 percent of cancer patients that were even on any kind of bronchodilator so that's kind of an easy button that could potentially um, get missed if we're not doing a really good assessment. Um, probably the first line for um, dyspnea is going to be opioids. There's, you know, oral opioids and there's IV. Um, there's no evidence for inhaled opioids. I know that a lot of times um, you can read about that and anecdotally people will talk about um, maybe even inhaled steroids, inhaled Lasix, inhaled morphine. They inhale almost everything. Um, and they, they can see that a lot of the drugs really don't make any that much more difference than, than just saline. Um, morphine is not superior to other opioids, although it's typically usually um, reached for first because it's kind of inexpensive and it's pretty easy to access. Um, 
if you use opioids, it may prolong survival rate by re reducing the physical and emotional distress and just the pure exhaustion. Often, again, we look at opioids as we typically um, put it together with pain, and when a patient's not having pain, that's not something that we often think about right away. Um, but it is important because it's really, really effective. So when we're thinking about, when we were talking about um, just uh, the feeling of breathlessness, what does that encompass? Um, we have to look at those, those multi-different prongs that are really affecting what the symptoms that, that you're seeing. Is it a thinking piece? Is it, how much is that thinking piece contributing to the breathing piece? How much of that functioning is con you know, um, contributing to the breathing piece? And all of these things are really, really intertwined and really highly related. And so uh, this picture, I think, um, defines well that you really, really need to be thinking in a holistic way in order to really hit the nail on the head and treat it effectively um, with the best outcome. So when we're talking about opioid dosing, these are just some starts. Um, a lot of times when, when patients come to us, if they're not on um, pain medication, starting off morphine as five milligrams as a single dose, it might be a really, really effective way to get them started and see how they react. Are they are they feeling a little bit better? Um, if they if if it's tolerated, um, giving it every four hours around the clock, holding for sedation, um, can do changing it to long acting or adding additional PRN dosing uh, for severe symptoms. Um, especially for palliative care patients, a lot of times the morphine again is used um, because we can dose it hourly and um, it's, it's easy to titrate um, and you can show really good uh, effect just by dosing even hourly. So for older adults, adults and people that retain CO2 or patients with kidney disease, um, important to go start, start low and go slow. Um, try to avoid the morphine in renal patients. Again, if you're looking at some of those smaller doses, maybe we can get away with it, depending on what the trajectory of their disease is, but that's something to be thinking about as well. So if you see somebody that maybe you're, you've got them on an opioid and they're still struggling with um, symptoms of breathlessness, increasing those um, dosages by 25 to 50% to see what they're looking like. Um, and once stable dosage is reached, again, we're talking about that long-acting opioid um, with immediate relief. So a lot of times it's a really low dose of the long-acting and maybe not even needing the breakthrough. Um, if we know planning ahead, if somebody is going to PT or somebody is going to have an activity that they're looking forward to, encouraging patients to medicate 30 minutes prior to that, to that activity to kind of optimize where they're at so they can participate. And if somebody is actively dying, that's when we consider um, how do we urgently and emergently um, get on the symptom and manage it for comfort. And oftentimes that really happens with IV uh, medications. Sometimes it's a titration if they're able to engage. And other times it's a continuous infusion if we need to get that under control. So this is another thing that sometimes we miss. Um, Non-pharmacological interventions. And this is really helpful because a lot of these things not only can the patients do um, for themselves, but their families can really get involved. And a lot of times when somebody's feeling short of breath, there's this feeling of powerlessness of somebody who's witnessing it. And so, you know, giving the extra education to the family members about how they can support their, their loved ones, it can be really, really powerful. And the first thing that we think of is, is positioning. Um, that tripod positioning, you know, hands hands on maybe a bedside table or a table in front, um, kind of opening up that diaphragm, um, sitting upright. A lot of times um, you'll see patients crunched over in their bed and they feel like they're short of breath. Well, if you put them up and get them kind of heads up again, they might feel a little bit better. And if we know that somebody has like a pleural effusion or um, a big mass in their lung, um, maybe positioning them lung by the, the bad lung down um, to really increase the ability for the good lung to ventilate. Um, there's breathing techniques. You can put them in the Google and give them um, some suggestions for that. Often we think about cooling, um, stimulating that trigeminal nerve can often help with that sensation of feeling like you're out of breath. So 
a fan or an open window, um, cooler rooms, humidified air, all of those can be really, really successful. And some um, extra, you know, um, complementary um, medicate or therapies such as acupuncture and acupressure, um, muscle relaxation with breathing tra uh, training, relaxation techniques, the cell phone, everybody's got one hanging off of their face these days. Um, and it's important to really use technology to your advantage if there's some apps out there that are really good. Um, and encouraging people to use kind of this hypnosis or these guided imagery or these relaxation apps to kind of talk them and work them through um, some of these incidences. Um, and that really is that coping and adaption. Sometimes just the cognitive behavioral therapy with talking with somebody. Um, there's also pulmonary rehab that can be really successful. Um, but there's the, the bottom line is there's always something we can do. Um, and helping our families and our patients know that there's hope and we're going to keep at it and giving them that sense that, that we're going to keep working at it. So um, when we're talking about oxygen, um, we typically go to it. Um, a lot of times, um, patients will not even, they don't have it. They, I saw patients yesterday who was really, really short of breath. His oxygenation by machine was 100%. When we're looking at that, we tend to you know, say, no, 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 they don't need oxygen. Well, for people with COPD, um, that really helps, even though they may be oxygenating at 100%, that feeling of, or that oxygenation can be really helpful for them. With cancer, not really. Um, they, the humidified air or just air can be just as effective. So when we're thinking about um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, you're seeing, we're seeing it a lot. We see the CPAPs and the BiPAPs and the high flow nasal cannulas. Um, we want to talk about what it's going to be doing to a patient or what it's going to be doing for a patient. So we know a little bit that it decreases the dyspnea of some patients um, with hypoventilation by rele relieving the work and effort. So really, truly, again, it's about en energy conservation in a lot of these patients, even if you're not seeing the true numbers, um, responding to that ability to to um, give them a break can be really, really um, helpful. And it's, but it is contraindicated if somebody has facial trauma, especially for the, like the, um, the bypass CPAP. If they have facial trauma, if their mask doesn't fit, if somebody has a history of nausea and vomiting, if they're not able to protect their airway, um, decreased mental status or excess secretions, all of those things so that those um, positive pressure things can actually drive stuff into their lungs and cause more harm than good. So when we're thinking about um, the, these things, these interventions at end of life, it, there's a variability. You kind of have to take each patient as they are and, and what, what is important, what is the goal of care. Of care. Um, there's limited dating. Date, data, my goodness, <laughs> um, regarding if it's helpful. And so um, the, is it, well, it, will it be to, well tolerated in this life? A lot, of, a lot of patients can't really, they're not mentating correctly um, like myself. And so when you, <laughs> when you put it on, sometimes they can be super, super distressing and they just want to take it off. So um, thinking about is that helpful, maybe even giving them up the opportunity to um, come off the opioids a little bit and be a little bit more present, that can be a benefit. Um, but also, does it, is it prolonging the dying process? Really, when we're thinking about this, it just becomes super complex. And as we've seen before, when you get a patient in the ER and somebody asks them, do you want us to put a tube down your throat to help you breathe, there's going to be a hundred percent of people that say absolutely please do that. So it's important to talk about these things when people are feeling well or feeling stable um, to really talk about goals of care and what's important to them and um, establishing how how big um, does this intervention need to get um, to match kind of what their their goals or their outcomes would look like um, and putting maybe even a time frame on it. We've had patients say, well, I'll, I'll accept intubation, but no longer than two days, no longer than three days. And really looking to them to, to 
tease those things out for those markers of success. What does success mean to them and what does quality of life mean to them? All of those are really, really important conversations. Next slide. So, final thoughts. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, important to think, oftentimes they get through this door and they go down the slippery slide of just chaos, especially when somebody can't breathe. So if we can be proactive and really um, talk about what's important, clarifying those goals of care, and really relinquishing the control to the patient, that's really how we get the best possible outcomes um, when treating this horrible and debilitating symptom. And that's it. Great job, Rana. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a really important topic. Um, just want to turn it out to the group. Um, just a couple of things to mention. Um, you know, you could use your chat box um, on the group chat and write down some questions. So that's one option. Um, you can raise your hand out there and we'll call on you. And those who are on the phones, uh, feel free to um, unmute and, and just speak up and we'll be able to reach out to you as well. Um, but are there any comments or questions? I'm really sure about that. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, one thing I just wanted to bring up, I'm so glad Rana mentioned this. Um, something that we sometimes see is just this moment of when someone's coming, whether it's the ER or, um, you know, it could be a community health aid clinic, um, at the village clinic, um, when someone's gasping for air and their option is to gas for air or to get intubated, um, of just like you said, most people are going to side with, I want to be intubated, you know, and, and I think it's really important to know that intubation is not, not, and putting an advanced airway is not the only way to control dyspnea, right. and that there are equally effective medications, just like you shared, and things that you can do to keep someone comfortable. So it doesn't have to be a decision to suffer or be intubated that we need to keep that in mind. And like you said, being able to focus on a time where someone is in a good place to have that conversation is so important. And um, because like in the moment, it's hard to even think right to, to know what you would want. Vicki. How about shortness of breath of a patient with pneumonia? How would you treat it differently? I mean, uh, oxygen support and antibiotics, you've got to treat the underlying, if it's, if it's um, reversible and that's within the goals of care, I mean, you've got to reverse the cause of what's happening. Giant, you know, pulmonary toilet, aggressive chest physical therapy, um, trying to mobilize the secretion, um, humidified air so they can get it out, maybe an expectorant, all of those things are really important. Um, but you don't really necessarily treat it any differently. How about how, how about morphine? Uh, I was told that's not the best treatment for uh, pneumonia. Amy, what do you think about uh, um, morphine and pneumonia? Are you speaking of inhaled morphine, Vicki, or are you talking about a different route? Uh, oh, no, not the inhaled. Just any way to treat it like a, a quick, you know, we, we treat the dyspnea with morphine for some air hunger. That for air hunger of persons in distress with pneumonia, would you treat it any specific treatment? Yeah, I think that we would have to be a little bit worried about using opioids um, in pneumonia just for the respiratory depression adverse effect and such. So um, I don't know if that would be like straight first line. I think what Ron is saying of oxygenation and treating it with antibiotics is the first line. Um, I was just curious about pediatric dosing for morphine in the setting of dyspnea. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to leave now. <laughs> well, in all, in all fairness, Rana's doses of morphine that are on there are basically, in my opinion, pediatric doses almost because <laughs> morphine comes in 15 milligram tablets as the smallest tablet strength and the dose in dyspnea is 5 milligrams. So, I'm guessing that it's a very small milligrams per kilo. I'd have to look it up to see what it would be in, in pediatrics. And we can send that out. It's interesting, like, um, like uh, there's this uh, 
primary palliative care that we often use. And, um, and there are uh, different ranges. And again, it's, it's you know, definitely weight-based. Um, and, and then also the neonates versus um, like different age ranges have different suggested doses as well. Um, and so, but what we'll do is we'll send it out to everybody because um, we definitely have those charts to, to be able to share. So I'm glad you asked. So. What other questions? Oh, Tricia. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Um, I just had an Afghan case about an individual who's in stage COPD and, you know, sort of grappling with what more can we do, how, how much further can we push the opioids as we're getting into territory. It might increase your quality but shorten the length of your life. And then also another steroid question. Um, this particular patient is on, I think, 10 milligrams of prednisone twice a day. Um, and I, it was interesting, and I was curious, Amy, what you've heard about this. I talked with one of the pulmonologists about it, because you know, this is out of my wheelhouse for sure. And he talked about how um, with you know end-stage COPD, you can start to get right-sided heart failure and then a little fluid buildup. And prednisone could somewhat exacerbate this. And so maybe switching to dexamethasone might contribute to less fluid buildup, but also give them a little bit benefit, continued benefit with the breathing, but yet also potentially shorten life because of infection risk. And so it was an interesting discussion because this could be helpful, but also you know, shorten this person's life, but enhance the quality of the shorter life. Um, but I was, so those are kind of two different topics. But I was curious what you heard, or what you know, maybe about the fluid buildup of prednisone versus Dex or you know, anybody. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't um, have any experience with that. I don't know if anybody else does. Um, <laughs> yeah, and. And again, I'm probably not going to use the right path of physiology terms, but I know that um, uh, as far as dexamethasone goes, it's um, it does not cause as many, um, I guess, periphery side effects. On others, it's it's a much um, and I forget the the term, but it the how it acts is very specific, and so. Um, and so that's why a lot of times they use the dexamethasone, whereas prednisone and um, uh, uh, other, uh, you know, steroids um, can sometimes cause all those side effects because they're um, they're generally or globally acting instead of, um, you know, in, in not as clean as the dexamethasone. So, but thanks for asking that. But you know. Um, the two things I'm going to write down is sending out pediatric dosing, um, and then also um, I know there's um, there's some good articles about the uh, uses of uh, um, steroids and what steroids to use, and <clears throat> and in kind of those pinpointed uh, um, effects. And so we'll send that out to the group as well. So, any other comments or thoughts before we move on? One. Oh. Was there any mention of uh, like using C CPAP machines? You mentioned intubation, but um, I know the masks are getting smaller and smaller for people that need to use a CPAP machine. And I'm just wondering if there are any references out there to air hunger and CPAP machines in this, this setting. They can certainly be really useful. You're right. They're getting, um, there's a lot of different, um, I think they're getting some different technology um, out there. A lot of the things that we're seeing in the unit even includes both high flow, double mode, uh, nasal cannulas that even avoid the CPAP um, because that can be so uncomfortable um, for people. Um, you have thoughts? On yeah, and I was just going to say it was interesting with the case. Um, that Trisha was working with, uh, they they were using BiPAP at the for end stage COPD, and so in in knowing that you know um, 
there's BiPAP and CPAP, and CPAP is more continuous positive pressure that you're getting. And so, but the machines that this person actually, they're sending people home with those machines because they are getting smaller and and they can um, get that uh, that positive pressure. Um, and, you know, again, BiPAP too, it's like not only pushing the air, but also helping someone to um, uh, do expiration so it goes in both directions. It can, you know, it can be really helpful. And I think something that's so important that um, we should all mention as well, and this also goes with congestive heart failure. What's so difficult about, like, there is not a defining point when someone is now on comfort focused care with CHF or COPD. Guess what? Your goals are still the same. You want to maximize the medical therapies. And in the realm of pulmonology, sometimes that means, um, you know, using uh, a CPAP or BiPAP. But also the medications and the inhalers, you want to maximize the abilities that you're using all the different medicines to control the dyspnea. And with congestive heart failure, you're using all your cardiac medications to maximize, you know, your diuretics and your uh, blood pressure medicines so that this way you're taking you know, you're, you're uh, not being uh, volume overloaded. And so, and that's what's so challenging. It's a collaboration. So like on that case that Trisha was mentioning, we actually reached out to the pulmonologist because, you know, it's not just palliative care. We need to do it as a team. And the same thing, I reach out to the cardiologist all the time to say, gosh, what, what's in your wheelhouse of things that you can do and combining both kind of those palliative medicines, including opioids, with the standard cardiac meds is so important so that they're tweaked. So. But good, good question. Well, we're going to go ahead and um, move on to introductions.